Hi there, um, this video is going to be about a technique which can be used in pawn races um, when the pawns are symmetrical um, and or sometimes perhaps not but generally I feel, feel the rule holds more true in kind of symmetrical situations. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule um, but it's something that I've kind of observed when just analysing these pawn races myself and it's kind of helped me out quite a lot in try, trying to determine what are the right what are the right pawn moves to make in these situations because in these situations in pawn races one side pretty much always wins it's very rare you'll have a see a draw after a pawn race so it's important that at fast time controls it's really difficult to um calculate out all the possibilities and one of the techniques that can be used, which was shown in the previous series, was mirroring, which is very useful. But it's not often possible to use that to determine immediately what the right move is. For example, the position in front of you here, with white to move, is actually it's a very interesting position. I think it's worth using it as a study. And if you'd like to pause the video and try and figure out white to move, what is the best move, and the best line of play, it's a really good exercise um, in these end games. The clue might you might have a bit of a clue in the name of the video, but I'm um, assuming if you've wanted to pause it, then you will have done so by now. And I'm going to carry on explaining what's happening here. The best move for White is to play G4. This is the only uh, good move, in fact. Um, the other the H4 moves can be quite dismissed quite easily. And after H3, G6, Black's created a mirror, so he's winning. And after H4 h5, g4, g5, again black's created a mirror and is winning so g4 is the only move that kind of avoids those situations and I often hold true of a kind of a, a rough rule that I use in these end games which is that it's, off, it's generally better to keep the pawn on its starting square for as long as possible in these pawn races because it gives a lot more flexibility to uh, in the tempo race and that's shown again in Black's most best response here. Um, Black is losing anyway, but I think the most testing response here is to move h5, following the same principle of leaving that pawn on its starting square. White can create mirrors against either of um, Black's other pawns, so mirror there and a mirror after g6, h4. So h5 is, avoids that situation. And now, if White moves the h-pawn or pushes the g-pawn then black will win the tempo race so g5 they'll just simply go like that and if he moves the h-pawn white uh, black can create a mirror h4 g5 is an obvious one and h3 g6 again is uh, doesn't take too long to convince yourself that that is a loss so white should follow this idea of keeping the pawn on its starting square for as long as possible capture on h5 and now this, really sh this position here, in fact, shows that extra flexibility that you get from not declaring where your initial, where your pawn's initial starting square is going to move to until the latest possible moment. Because now after g5, White will play h3 and win, and after g6, he'll play h4 and win. Um, so I think that's quite a nice little study there of showing this idea of the kind. I like to think of it as the power of, like, the two mover. So this pawn here that can move either one or two squares and just trying to hold back um, that pawn for as long as possible and black tries to do the same thing but in this particular case um, loses out let me move on to another example with, on the same theme so here um, it wouldn't be at all obvious to me looking at this position um, at first glance who's winning um, and in a real game situation I'd probably have a couple of seconds to make a decision on my move and the way I'll do this is basically just as I've already said keep those pawns on the start of the grass for as long as possible and play h5 which has the extra benefit of locking down that pawn on h7 and, and um, well not locking it down but preventing that pawn on h7 from moving and if it was white's move again here he'd play h6 and basically take out black's flexible pawn um, the best move I would say here for black, or I'll probably play is f5. If black tried to capture that pawn, which would be the other option, then this is when you probably have to start calculating, and it turns out that white is winning after the move g4, um, which um, 
if black now plays h5 then that can be captured and then white will still have his flexible pawn on f2 and, and win so if um, black tries to play something else h6 then white shows this extra flexibility and plays f3 f4 would uh, not be a good move because of h5 um, but now um, white simply wins with g5 and f4 So after f5, h6, as I said before, again, keeping those pawns flexible, and now I'd be feeling pretty confident as white, because it's fairly straightforward to calculate out after either of black's moves, and generally with the more flexible pawns you'll almost, al you'll almost always win these endgames. g4, f3, and white wins. And if f4, then g4, and after g5, f3 wins, and if you capture, f4 and white wins the, the pawn race. So that's a good thing to keep in mind, just this idea. It's, as I said, it's not a hard and fast rule. I have seen examples where um, it may look like one side has more pawns than their starting squares, but yet they still lose. But generally, it's a good rule to have, and um, it holds true in the vast majority of cases in my experience.